So today, we're gonna to deal with a 25 mark tax question. This was actually asked in some capacity in last year's paper, the June 2017 paper. They asked the question about the government imposing a sugar tax and what implications that would have on the microeconomy. This is how you lay out an answer on taxation to get some really top marks. We're gonna start the video off, half will be the analysis and the other half I will go through evaluations. Feel free in the essay to go between analysis and evaluations, but make it very clear when you are going between the points by separating out your paragraphs. Step one, the first thing that I always want you to do is to define an indirect tax. So an indirect tax is a tax that is levied on goods and services. It's as simple as that. Try to identify from the question whether this is a specific tax or an ad valorem tax. It will be pretty obvious from the question which it is. For example, in the paper in June 2017, it was an ad valorem tax because they added a percentage on top of it. So you would define an ad valorem tax. After you do that, you now need to draw the diagram and look at the video where we go through the systematic approach to constructing the tax diagram. Make sure you get every single mark on that diagram. Now, there's a golden rule in economics which I have banged on about. Every time I have a video talking about a diagram, I always mention the fact that we need to explain the effects that we now see on the diagram. So let's just quickly go through that. Number one, what happens to the price of sugar, sugary drinks or sugary food? Well, it's gonna go up because the price rises when the supply curve shifts inwards. What therefore happens to the amount of units that are consumed of that thing? It's gonna go down. So the starting point is simply to talk about how the price has risen from P1 to P2 and the quantity has fallen from Q1 to Q2. Now it's always a good idea to throw in some technical terminology at this stage. What happens to consumer surplus? Well, consumer surplus falls because if you remember consumer surplus is the difference between the maximum price you're willing and able to pay for a good and the actual market price. So consumer surplus falls, but so does producer surplus here by the way because now the producer has to give up some of their revenue to the government. Some of it goes to the government, their costs are now going up. So that's our nice easy starting point, just a clear explanation of knowledge, application analysis, based on what we actually see and observe based on the diagram. Paragraph number two of analysis. One of the things that you could easily talk about is now that the price of sugary drinks or sugary, I don't know, chocolates go up, you are more likely to switch to substitute goods. And in the development of that point, I wanna make sure that you always have the opportunity to show off. You should know that substitute goods have a positive XED. A really easy, silly way of remembering it is, think about it from the perspective of a football match. When the manager brings on a substitute, they're hoping they have a positive impact. So XED will be positive. So an example could be, I might consume less chocolate, I might now eat more vegetables, just as a random example. And you can develop that and construct a really effective paragraph on the back of that. Third paragraph. Now this is where we can really show off that we are an A-star student. You are going to draw a really technical diagram. And the technical diagram is to draw a negative externality diagram first. If you don't know how to do that, please check out the video on externalities. Once you've drawn the negative externality diagram, we are now going to correct that market failure. And the way that we're correcting the market failure is through the tax. Think about what a tax does. The marginal private cost, the cost of the individual consuming this good or buying this good, is now higher because the government has imposed the tax. As a result of that, your MPC line is going to shift inwards. And I want you to shift it inwards exactly to the point of social optimum. In other words, we have corrected the market failure. Now, I know this is really lame, but I have a favorite sentence in theme one. My favorite sentence is this, the effect of the tax is to internalize the external cost associated with the consumption of sugar, for example. What that means is this, it means that before, those people that were overindulging in chocolates and sugary drinks, there were no consequences for them. Because even though the cost of the NHS were going up, even though a lot of taxpayers were paying towards, you know, their healthcare and things like that, there was no ramification. However, now it's like saying to them, okay, you wanna be obese, you wanna overindulge in sugary food, no problem, go for it. But now you pay for your own treatment. 
That is what internalizing the external cost is. If the question was something about smoking, well, if you impose a higher tax on cigarettes, that would be internalizing the external cost because the individual that now wants to smoke has to pay that higher price and essentially compensate society. So you draw that and then the paragraph is really straightforward. Because once you've talked about the shift of MPC inwards and the fact that you have internalized the external cost, you can just simply talk about the benefits of less people eating sugary food, less people becoming obese. So there'll be less strain on the NHS. There will be higher worker productivity, etc., etc. You get the point. So that's our third really effective point in terms of analysis. The fourth is a really cool word. And now bear in mind that when we get to the judgment later on at the end of the essay, we need to always have a particular kind of point of view. We need to clearly state whether we think this will be effective or not effective. One of the things that they really like on the mark scheme is prioritization. Prioritization is where you say, hey, this is the most important point and then justify it through economic theory. This is our prioritized point. We're going to say that taxation is extremely effective if the revenue that they generate is hypothecated. Cool word. Let's talk about what hypothecated means. Hypothecating revenue means that the government spends the revenue they collect from the tax back on that problem. So for example, if I hypothecate revenue from a sugar tax, I'm trying to deal with the obesity crisis in the UK, right? Well, if I now use the revenue to subsidize, I don't know, gyms, if I can subsidize free healthy school meals for children, that is an example of hypothecating the tax revenue. And that is the unique thing about taxation that you don't get, for example, in a minimum price scheme. Minimum price scheme, the number of people consuming the good also goes down, the price also goes up. But in a tax, the additional benefit is the government collects money. And if they use that money wisely, they can spend it back on the problem. So a great thing that you could have done in that essay, by the way, is to say, okay, the government can hypothecate it by spending on free school meals that are healthy. Jamie Oliver always talks about this. And then you can show off. How do you show off? You can bring in a concept from theme one known as behavioral economics. Behavioral economics talks about how people are in the habit of doing something. Well, if from a very young age, school children are eating healthy meals, that becomes the habit. And therefore, as they grow older, they're more used to eating healthy meals. The government doesn't need to worry about there being massive amounts of obesity. That is an incredible paragraph. So if you talk about how the government can hypothecate the tax revenue and give an example of that, then that is really high level analysis. So that's analysis done. Evaluations. Evaluation number one is really straightforward and it will always be the case that this is an evaluative point for any question on tax, irrespective of the context. It is to talk about the price elasticity of demand for the good. So if the demand for the good is inelastic, so cigarettes is a good example of that, right? Because we know that people that smoke, typically they're addicted. Therefore, the demand for the good is extremely inelastic. Even if the price goes up, yes, they'll consume a little bit less because they can't afford to buy as many packets. But they're not going to dramatically reduce the number of units that they consume. Therefore, even though they impose this tax, the number of people consuming, be it sugar, cigarettes, whatever the question is, isn't going to dramatically fall. So the impact may be quite limited. And the way that you can go beyond that is to say, okay, because in this instance, the incidence of tax, in other words, what's burdened by the consumer, so the consumer incidence of tax is going to be much higher than the producer incidence of tax. The consumer is gonna pay the bulk of the tax because they're addicted. If demand is inelastic, they will continue to purchase this good at large quantities. It won't have that big an impact on the market. If on the other hand it's elastic, by the way, then this is going to have a big impact. But typically the questions they tend to ask often are inelastic. But don't take it as for granted that that's the case. Make a judgment based on what you think is true. Often it will be inelastic. So that's number one. Number two, the second evaluative point is to talk about whether the substitute goods that you were speaking about before are strong or weak. So for example, not many people see chocolates and vegetables as necessarily strong substitutes. So even if the price of chocolates go up, I don't necessarily switch to vegetables. Some people might. And the way that you can develop that is by saying, okay, if XED, cross elasticity of demand, 
is less than one, in other words, it's inelastic, is that a strong or weak relationship? Well, it's a weak relationship because even though the price of chocolate could go up significantly, the demand for vegetables will only go up a little bit, not that much, because people don't really see them as substitutes. And then you can go one step further and talk about the scenario where for some people, XED might equal zero. Now, what does that mean if XED equals zero? If XED equals zero, it means that there is no relationship at all between the two goods. So for example, if the price of chicken goes up, doesn't affect my demand for cars. I don't, unless you like to eat chicken whilst driving, but the point is, is there's probably no relationship between the price of chicken and the demand for cars. And you could always throw that in as an evaluation, not chicken and cars, by the way, just to say, hey, even though the price of chocolate has gone up, that may not necessarily have any bearing on the demand for whatever substitute good that you have discussed in your analysis. Two, number three, the third evaluative point is to talk about the fact that any indirect tax like this actually is regressive in nature. What that means is this. It means that it will disproportionately affect low-income households more than high-income because if I'm a low-income household, as a proportion of my spending, this is a greater amount. So that tax affects me more negatively than it does someone that has loads and loads of money. So what does that do to income inequality? Well it's going to worsen income inequality. That therefore is an example of government failure. It's where the government steps in to try and correct the market failure, in this instance obesity, but they end up making it worse. That's three. Number four, bear in mind by the way I'm doing more evaluative points than you actually need, just in case you forget one of them in the exam. The fourth evaluative point is simply this. Whenever the government imposes a tax, it starts to encourage people to turn to the hidden economy, also known as the shadow market. The hidden economy is basically where people illegally smuggle, let's say cigarettes or whatever the context might be. Again, that is an example of government failure because if people end up buying smuggled cigarettes, not only are they still consuming cigarettes, it could be that the quality of those cigarettes is even more harmful to them because they haven't gone through the checks, they haven't gone through the health and safety checks. So by go the government imposing this tax, it may incentivize people to turn to illegal activity. Again, government failure. The very final generic evaluative point that works for something like this is to question whether actually sugar is the only reason why people are obese. That's probably not true, right? There are loads of other factors that we could help explain why there's high levels of obesity. So for example, fatty food, you know, like burgers and chips and all those good stuff. That could also help explain why there's high levels of obesity. So therefore, although the government is tackling it from the perspective of sugar, that in itself may not be enough. A really easy point to develop as well, by the way, honestly, Netflix. So many kids nowadays are sitting behind their screens watching Netflix all day rather than running around outside or going to the gym. I sound really old, I know. But the point is this, there are more explanations for why there is obesity than just simply saying, hey, it's because people are eating sugar. That could be a very easy evaluative point that you could throw in. So we have all of our analysis and we have all of our evaluations. It is imperative in a 25 marker that you have a judgment. Your marks are capped if you do not have a judgment. And a judgment isn't just simply a conclusion where you wrap up and reevaluate or talk about what you've discussed up to now. No, your judgment is where you take a very clear stance as to whether you think this is effective or not. If the question says, what is more effective, a tax or a minimum price scheme? Don't sit on the fence. Pick a side and say that this is better because of this. You could sometimes say a combination of the two, but be very clear in your judgment to make it very, very apparent that you are picking a particular side. In this particular essay, my judgment could be something like this. On the balance of evidence, although there are problems associated with imposing a tax, these are outweighed by the benefits. In particular, so we're gonna now prioritize, in particular, if the government hypothecates the tax revenue and subsidizes gyms and free healthy meals, then this would be an effective combination which could help to reduce the level of obesity in the UK. You would go and develop it beyond that, but that is the essence of your judgment. Your judgment makes it very clear that you have picked a side and you justify through economic theory why you have picked that side. So for us in our essay, 
we're always going to say when it comes to tax that the government can hypothecate the revenue and that would be an amazing essay. Check out some of our other videos as well and subscribe and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you for watching. Why not subscribe to our platform to see other videos like this one? You can also register to attend intensive revision courses, book a private tutor and utilize our in-house revision resources to help you achieve top grades. Good luck.